Good morning, I'm Mark Valadez, pastor of New Beginnings Church in Napomo. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Last week we began to talk about being in a, a battle daily. It's a spiritual battle. But this battle affects everything that we do in the physical realm. The Holy Spirit told us through Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 that a final word, verses 10 to 13, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that, why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, the spiritual realm, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Again, why? So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil as he tempts us to do evil, to do our own thing and to say, God, just talk to the hand or don't even talk to me. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm, not just standing, but standing firm. And that's God's desire is that we win this battle of being, um, unkind, of being selfish, of being divisive, of being hateful, of being resentful, of being bitter, of being unforgiving, and on and on the list goes. And I wish I could say, you know, I've arrived there, but I haven't arrived there. I, like every single one of us that are breathing on the face of this earth, we're all works in progress. So as we have said, we're in a life and death struggle. And the word struggle here was a, a, a term to mean like wrestling, which uh, initially when the wrestler would get pinned, that he would get his eyes gouged out. Uh, then they went a step further to where just not gouging out his eyes, but killing him, executing the, the person. So we know that the battle begins in our minds and Satan's desire is to blind us to God's truth which leads to spiritual death. And it also leads to death in relationships, uh, could be our health, uh, finances, whatever it might be. Scriptures that we've talked about in the past in dealing in this area is 2 Corinthians 2.11, where it says, um, we are familiar because we're hanging out with God his scriptures are being part of our lives. We're not just reading through the Bible, but as we read through it, we allow the Bible to go through us. That we are familiar with his evil schemes, which means mind games. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, and I've added a, a few words to help explain what's being read here. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, which is prayer, His Word, the Bible, and Christian friends. Uh, and we don't use worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning, the world's mindset, and to destroy false arguments, which are lies. We destroyed every proud obstacle of, I know it all, I'm right, <laughs> it's all about me, that keeps people from knowing by experience and intimately from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. In other words, we change our thinking from the world's mindset to God's mindset. Six, Ephesians chapter 6, 11, put on all of God's armor, as we read before, so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies, all the temptations, all the bait that he dangles in front of us that he uses to try to get into our minds so that instead of looking at God, we'll da -da 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 -da, look over at him and, and what he would want us to embrace instead of what God would want us to embrace, to distract us. The areas of... Um, the distraction that the demonic realm that Satan uses three areas and it's been used since the beginning of time since Adam and Eve um, I'm going to read from 1st John chapter 2 verses 15 to 17 where the Holy Spirit encouraged John to write don't love this world the world's mindset 
nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. Because the things of the world are numero uno, number one in our lives. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. And these are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever with Him. So again, from John, where John explains it, and as we look back, as we'll look back at Adam and Eve, and we'll take a look at Jesus when Satan was tempting, testing Jesus in Matthew 4, these three areas that we'll go over. Okay, so Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? She said, Well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. Only this one out of hundreds or thousands, however many there were, I wasn't there, I'm not that old, that we are not allowed to eat, just this one. And God, God said, You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. And the serpent said, ah, Yeah, give me a break. You won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like him, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. She was listening to what Satan had to say. The words, she saw him, and she heard the words. They came into her mind, and she decided to embrace those instead of embracing what God had for her. Satan's desire is to try to make us think that God is holding out on us. He, he's withholding from us. So we need to make our own opportunities. We need to go ahead and um, make our own pleasure instead of resting in him and doing what God would have us to do, how to live, which is a life of what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's always about others. And so... Instead of doing that, his does, he, he tries to make us think, no, it's all about you. You need to make your own self happy. Um, and you can't rely on him. Okay, so anyway, so he says to the woman, to Eve, God's not going to do this or that. And, but if you do eat the fruit, well, then he knows that you're going to become just like him. And he doesn't want that to happen because he's jealous. The woman was convinced. She saw, she saw, she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And so she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it as well. All right. So first she saw that the fruit was good uh, for food. That's the physical, the lust of the flesh. And it was pleasing to the eye. Mm, it's, oh, you, you, it's going to feel good. Get it. Um, and that's the, the I'm, so the first one, excuse me, was the lust of the flesh. I think I did say that. Then the second one is the lust of the eyes. And the third, it was desirable for gaining wisdom to be like God. And that's the pride of life. Those three things that John talked about in 1 John chapter 2. And then when Satan appeared to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. So after that time, the devil came to Jesus and said, Since you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread and the the idea there loaves of bread was the kind that you took it right out of the oven it was hot it smelled so good and now remember jesus hadn't eaten it all for 40 days and so satan tempts him in that area um well, we'll talk about that in just a minute but jesus told him what he quoted scripture. No, because the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, 
um, by feeding, by fulfilling one, one's natural cravings. It's got to be about God first. People don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, there to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are, since you're the Son of God, then jump off. Because, and he quotes scripture, but of course it's out of context, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus responded, Ah, but the scriptures say you must not test the Lord your God. Now, the only area that the scriptures allow us to test God is in the area of our finances, which is, as we call it, tithing. And so we can test him in that area, but not any other area. Um, and he tells us that in Malachi chapter 3. Okay, and then Matthew 4 verse 8. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, I will give it all to you. If you will kneel and worship me. <laughs> yeah, right. And Jesus said, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say you must worship <clears throat> excuse me, the Lord your God <clears throat> excuse me, and serve only him. So he saw um, the he saw the bread. And it was going to um, make him feel good for food, lust of the flesh. And it was pleasing to the eye. So lust of the eyes. And seeing the kingdoms and, and that um, if you worship me, I'll give you these kingdoms. And so Satan was testing him in the area of the pride of life. So taking a look specifically at the lust of the flesh that was again the physical which is immorality uh, it could be sexual sin the lust for physical pleasure if it feels good do it the opposite of this is self-control that the lust of the flesh is a belief or attitude that attempts to convince us that the thrill of passion is far more important than seeking or depending upon god that thrilling our senses with the misuse of what sex, drugs, alcohol, laziness, whatever it might be. The mindset of the world that says, oh, you do this and boy, you've arrived or this is going to make you happy or whatever. Um, is far more important than seeking and knowing God. That the lies of the lust of the flesh want us to believe that passion is a true God. These lies are an attempt to to draw us away from seeking and depending upon God. And then it's the lust of the eyes, and that's emotional security, something of greater value to us than God. Possessions, accumulating things, materialism, retail therapy. The lust of the eyes is a belief or attitude that attempts to convince us that the desire for possessions is far more important than seeking or depending upon God. Now, what you have... That's it. That, hey, you get that car, you are styling, or whatever it might be. When we get to the point of, that looks good, I want it, I'm going to get it, the battle is usually over. Envy will fuel this. It always wants more. It's consumerism gone crazy. The opposite of this is contentment, which what is contentment? It's a byproduct of giving Everything we have, we are, and ever will be over to God. And then allowing God to give back whatever he sees is good for us. To, to give back everything except that which will enslave us or try to derail our faith or distract us. And then trusting God's decision. Footholds are the byproduct of slavery to anything else that God doesn't want in our lives. Satan wants us to believe that getting positive self-esteem from owning things is far more important than seeking and knowing God. That owning stylish clothes, a hot car, is more important than seeking and knowing God. That the lies of the lust of the eyes want us to believe that possessions are a true God. 
These lies attempt to draw us away from seeking and depending upon who? Upon God. And so there's a, a foothold that is there, which is something that just stays and is just gnawing at us. Like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Or uh, another example could be, oh, I see that person and I hate them. I hate them because we've given the enemy a foothold of unforgiveness, of bitterness and resentment. So when we see that person and it could even become then a stronghold to where it's just overbearing, it's there. And it's almost like we're consumed with um, getting revenge, getting even with that person. And God says, no, no. That's why he says, uh, through God tells us through Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because when you do, you're giving the devil a foothold into your spiritual life. And God says, no good, no bueno. And then the boastful pride of life is a mental obsession of one's status and importance. That it's all about power and prestige. You know, look what I've done. Look what I have. And the opposite of this is humility. Satan wants us to believe that having authority over other people is more important than seeking and knowing God. That being popular is more important than seeking and knowing God. And these lies are an attempt to draw us away from what? Seeking and depending upon God. Because it's all about how we look and how we feel. It's all about us. Which with Jesus, it's all about what he wants for us in our lives instead of what we want for our lives. And what does he want? He wants us to experience his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his good. And he wants us to give others he wants to use us as a conduit as a funnel so that we give god or we give others god's love and joy and peace and patience and all of that galatians 5 verses 17 and 18 paul had written to written a letter to the people that lived in galatia so it's called galatians and he said this, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this to these people and therefore to all of us, that the sinful nature, the selfish nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful, selfish nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to listen, to follow the temptations from the enemy. And it says you're not under the obligation to the law of Moses. Or what it's talking about is you're not under the obligation to be in subjection to the system that results from perverting the instructions of God, the Torah, into legalism into not having a relationship with God, but just you know, having a desire to, yeah, hey, I'm a good person, but when it comes to a relationship or growing, um, the enemy is like, no, nah, you don't need that. And so we embrace those thoughts instead of making those thoughts, as Second Corinthians 10 tells us, captive to the obedience. So we take those thoughts that, uh-uh, wrong time out those thoughts personal foul they're not good so god here you go i've stopped these thoughts i'm giving them to you and help me to think give me the truth so i can think about the truth see we will want to have a relationship with jesus more than we want to continue in sin in pleasing ourselves we will have to repent as well as believe to the point where it changes our lifestyle, where it changes how we live. Some people think, well, yeah, I believe in God, but does it change how you live? Do you have a relationship with him? Are you becoming more like him, allowing his power to give you the strength and the discernment, the power, the know-how to do that? 
So we put on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17, and I'm not going to go through which each one is. Um, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. It says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, which is, you put on God's truth, okay? And the belt held different things. It held the sword, it, it, it helped hold the shield, and all of that. So, from the, he says... Um, putting on the belt of truth, God's truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from God, comes from the good news, so that you'll be fully prepared. So as things come, different trials come, that we can experience His peace because we know what the truth is. God's not surprised about anything, and God is with us. Okay? In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith, having faith in him to stop the fiery arrows, the temptations of the devil. So what do we do? We put on salvation from God. That word salvation, we put on his freedom, his deliverance from sin so that we can have victory over temptation. Put on the salvation as your helmet. What are you thinking about? Because it's the battle begins there. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, it's all about living for Him, allowing Him to live in us. So, once again, we are to put on and keep on God's truth, His righteousness, His peace, having faith in Him, having His salvation, deliverance, and freedom, and His Word in our lives. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, Paul writes to us, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all why? Well, because of all he's done for you. He, so he, he's given you salvation and forgiveness and love and empowerment. He's given you all this. And so uh, please give yourself to him. Okay. Give your bodies to God and um, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. So how are we living? How are we, what are we doing with this body that he's given us? He says, this is truly the way to worship him, to show that he's worth it. That's worship, worthship. What is he worth? Verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, the mindset of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know. Changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know by experience. God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. Again, we will want to. We will have to want a relationship with Jesus more than we want to continue in sin. We will have to repent as well as believe to the point where it changes our lifestyle. Neil Anderson, some of you, you've gone through this yourselves, has um, what's called Steps to Freedom. It's a spiritual inventory because spiritually what we have exposed ourselves to in the spiritual realm affects us physically, affects how we think and therefore how we think affects how we feel about things and how we feel and think affects how we live. And so my desire is um, I'm going to have copies of this uh, at church. And um, at some point, uh, if you want a copy, I could um, copy and paste and email it to you. But it's awesome stuff. I think every Christian should go through it. Uh, it's really good. So the first step and I'm only going to talk about the first two steps today. Talk about counterfeit versus real. And as I believe, Dr. Anderson was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, The first step to freedom in Christ is to renounce your previous or current involvements with satanically inspired occult practices and false religions. 
You need to renounce any activity and group which denies Jesus Christ, offers guidance through any source other than the absolute authority of the Word of God, or requires secret initiations, ceremonies, or covenants. So in order to help you assess your spiritual experiences, begin this step by asking God to reveal false guidance and counterfeit religious experiences. So this is what we would pray, and he's got the prayer written out. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to guard my heart and my mind and reveal to me any and all involvement I have had either knowingly or unknowingly with cultic or occult practices, false religions, and false teachers. In Jesus' name I pray. And then he's got a list of just some of the non-Christian um, deals that we'd be participating in. And then he has a prayer that, Lord, I confess that I have participating in, participate in like playing with the Ouija board or whatever that might be. And I ask your forgiveness and I renounce playing with the Ouija board. And step number two talks about deception versus truth. Have we allowed the enemy to deceive us? And so he's got some areas of being deceived. And then he has a prayer there that, Lord, I agree that I have been deceived in the area of thinking um, I am something when I am not or whatever it might be. And then it's, thank you for forgiving me. I commit myself to know and follow your truth. And on and on the list goes. But it's, it's excellent stuff. And it's steps to freedom, which is what Jesus is all about. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and what your word has told us. It's told us that we're in a spiritual battle, what this battle is like, um, and uh, Satan's tools to try to get our eyes off of you and to um, try to get our dependence off of you and onto ourselves or something else. And those times that we have done that, please forgive us, Lord, and thank you for forgiving us. And God, remind us today, throughout the day, and every day that goes before us to ask you, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me, God, so I may have your thoughts, feelings, attitudes, actions, and words. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, go to our website to uh, check out the happenings, or I'd love to hear from you. So that's nbccn.org, nbccn.org. Again, I'm Mark Valadez, pastor of Napomo New Beginnings Community Church of the Nazarene, and thank you for joining us this morning. And I just pray that you'll have a great day and an awesome week and one of freedom. Amen.